game. Are you ready? I feel like I've heard that football whistle like, I don't know, thousands of times in the last week. I don't know. I, I don't know when football just overtook life, like every night of the week. There's just no room for Hallmark movies anymore because football is always on, right? It's just, it really is. Not that I'm, you know, I'm a, a bit of a football fan. I like the fourth quarter of most games. <laughs> that, that's about it. That, if I go to a game, I like the food and the atmosphere. But I have the privilege, you guys, of talking to you this morning about, in this series of Get in the Game, about renewing your first love, about renewing your first love. So Pastor Kelly had a first love. He, he had a first love, and she rode by on this sparkly pink Schwinn when he was a kid. Like this, this would come by his window, and you'd probably find him peeking out, like ponytails flying in the wind, tassels off the handlebars. She probably honked her little horn on her handlebars as she went by his house. I know this is his first love. This little girl that captivated him when he lived in a little house in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, her name was Callie. If you don't believe that he had a first love, let me just tell you all these years later, our firstborn daughter's name is Callie. <laughs> okay, so he can say, no, 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 that's her name, right? I know I'm not wrong in this. Okay, that's a first crush, right? That's not the love we're talking about today. It's, it's not. We all have something in our life that probably captivated our heart uh, uh, at one point or another. I have one too. His name was not Braxton, <laughs> right? I did not name my firstborn son uh, off my first crush, but nonetheless, we love Callie. We love her name. Um, I don't know. I'm sure that girl was adorable that drove by Kelly's house back in the day. Our first love, right? It's Jesus. We know this. I'm not going to stand here today and go, okay, this is what you need to know. You need to understand that Jesus is your first love. If you're, if you're not sure who your first love should be, it's Jesus. I'm not here to teach you that today because I feel like collectively, probably in this room today, we, we know that, right? We know that. We know who it's supposed to be. But keeping that renewed in our life, Keeping it front and center in our life is not always the easiest thing because we live in this world. Scripture shows us, I mean, in Scripture right here, plain as day, what we should love and what we shouldn't love. It says in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, your strength, all your mind. Love the Lord your God. This is the first and greatest commandment, it says. So we know right here in Scripture, that's what it says. Love the Lord. He is your first love, right? It also tells us in Scripture in 1 John 2.15, the Word also tells us what not to love. Do not love the world. Do not love the world or the things that it has to offer you. Don't love the world. So what I can kind of deduce from this, it tells us what to love as our first and greatest commandment. The word tells us what not to love because it says don't love the world. So that tells me that somewhere between the two, there's going to be a competition for your heart, right? It's like a game. No one shows up to a game that isn't some kind of a competition. So right here, right now, as we learn to just kind of renew our first love and understand what that looks like to us, you need to understand one thing. You're walking out a competition in this life, right? You don't just get to sail through it and be the winner. All right, here I go. I get the gold medal, right? I'm just, I'm the winner. I'm the winner. My team is going to win. No, you're going to have to, what, fight for it? We've been through these things in this series, like renew your, your first love, get in the game, keep it simple, trust the word, all of these things. There's a, a heaven to gain, a hell to lose. All of these things, I feel like, are coming together to remind us that we got to show up for this game. And we have to understand that it might take us a little bit of practice, right? Because it's going to be a bit of a competition if we are going to emerge the winner. The scripture tells us that. But how do we, I, I wish I had it today, but I couldn't, it's not a, a common thing that you could just 
you know, go to Target and buy. I would have had to order it sooner on Amazon. But what if before you today were this scale, um, uh, like a balance scale, right? The kind that you put something heavy on it. And you like, if you're going to have, a, a, if the doctor says, you know, you're at risk for a heart attack and you put a balance scale before you and you want to eat the cupcake and it just goes like, Hoomph, and you got to balance it out with some apples, right? Probably three or four for it to like balance it out. If there was this balance scale in front of you, how do you tip the scale in your favor for God being your first love in your life? How are you going to tip that scale? How are you going to have more wins than losses in your life? That is what I want to talk about today because I believe it's possible and I also believe that we need to always be tipping the scale. You know, there was this competition that went on in my house when our kids were young, right? Four kids, um, all close together in age, so this cluster of kids. So this, this competition that went on for a long time in our house was for space on the refrigerator for your artwork, right? Four kids, right? There's only so much space on the refrigerator for the artwork. And my kids' artwork was funny. I wish I could have gotten in the attic. There's some renovations going on in our house, so I, I couldn't get up, but I have a file that's got the artwork, some, some artwork that I saved. Right, right now, young moms, save more things like that because later on you're going to remember and you're going to wish you had a lot of these things. But the kids would draw artwork and it needed to go on the fridge. So Callie, her artwork was always really cute. So I, I'm thinking like family pictures that they would draw. She would always draw a house. It had a chimney. It would have smoke coming out. She would have a mom and a dad and Callie a brother, a sister, another brother, and a dog. She always would put a dog in the front yard. We did not have a dog, but she always put a dog in the front yard. She was literally convinced that she was the only one in her class that didn't have a dog, but she always drew a dog in her family picture well before we had a dog. Kelson, I remember he had this family picture and he'd made it um, for his dad. They were, they were doing something in school that talked about your dad. It was all the favorite things that he liked about his dad. He had his family and he had his dad. And, and in his, it, the teacher would fill in things that they said. And it was like, what, are, what is something that you love about your dad? What does your dad do? And he was like, my dad is an OU singer. Like he's never been an OU singer. <laughs> Like he did sing, but at the time we were pastoring a church in Norman and we met on the OU campus and Kelly helped play in the worship band. So Kelson didn't fully understand he's a pastor. He was like an OU singer. What are you, what are you um, like, what are you happiest? When is your dad the happiest? My dad is happiest when he's smoking. I'm like, what? I'm looking at this family thing. It's like smoking, like smoking barbecue probably. But, you know, as the pastor, you might clarify that a little bit. I don't think he was out smoking, you know, he and Kelson in the yard. But his family pictures were funny. Braxton is the one. He's here today. So I can, I, I'm, I, I'm so glad that I thought of this story. I wish I had this picture. Braxton is the one that when he would find his artwork in the trash can because, you know, you can only save so much. There's only so much space. Braxton is the one that would bring his picture to me, like wiping off the ranch dressing and being like, you threw my picture in the trash and, you know, like trying to clean it off and putting it back up on the fridge, right? And I'm like, what's a mom to do? There's only so much space. But Braxton's family pictures were so funny. So he would draw... He would draw Kelly, he would draw me, he would draw a big sister, and he's a twin, and then he has a younger brother who's just, you know, barely a year younger than him. But from very early on, Brooklyn was taller than him as a, as a twin. So he was like, Braxton, here's, she was just tall early on. He's taller than her now, but that wasn't always the case. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, when his his twin sister was taller than him when he was young. His little brother comes on the scene and then he quickly became taller than Braxton. But every time Braxton would draw his family pictures, he would draw Kelly, he would draw me, he would draw a big sister. He would draw himself like big, not as big as Callie, but big. Uh, he would always draw Brooklyn smaller than him and he would always draw Kelson the smallest. <laughs> it did not matter that Kelson was four inches taller than him. Kelson was always little. 
But here's my problem with this picture. Every time Braxton drew a family picture, he always drew me fat. <laughs> Every single time. I have been basically about the same size most of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Except for when I was pregnant with that boy because there were two at once. He always drew me fat. And we look at this picture and be like, I want to be amazed with your artwork. I want to be, I want to put it front and center right there. But every time I look at it, I'm like, why am I always the fat one? Why do I look like a baked potato and everybody else is skinny? So his picture sometimes would like find its way in the trash can, right? And he'd come back and be like, there's ketchup on it and you don't love me. And he would put his pictures back on the fridge every time. Because sometimes there are things in our life that we can decide to be amazed with and we can like look at the thing as a whole or we can be like yeah nothing amazing in that artwork I'm gonna cast that aside right okay God in scripture shows us these two beautiful instances with Jesus where he was amazed see I love that word right now amazed it's just it's in my heart amazed is is used, or a version of that word, marveled, amazed, astonished. It's used a lot in scripture. About 40, 43 times it's used. And most often it's talking about they were amazed with Jesus. They were just astonished with his authority, with the way they were amazed at how he could, he could speak to demons and they would flee, how he could heal people, his stories. People were amazed with him all of the time, but there are only two instances in scripture where it says Jesus was amazed, amazed with people. I wanna read you a couple of things. I didn't put these um, up today on the the screen because I just wanna read you. They're they're just a little bit longer, but there is a place in um, Luke chapter seven. So you can write that down. You can flag this in your Bible. You're gonna wanna, if you've got your Bible, you're gonna wanna highlight this portion of scripture that talks about amaze. But let me just read this to you here for a minute. It's the faith of the centurion. When Jesus had finished saying these things, I'm starting in chapter one, um, saying all of this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. A centurion was a soldier. A soldier, century, a hundred years. It's a soldier who's in charge of about a hundred people. So this soldier has a servant who is sick. A servant who is sick. Not a son, not a wife, not, not a like tight family member, a servant who is sick. The centurion heard Jesus, heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, They pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation. He's built a synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I don't deserve to have you to come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Say the word, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one this, go, and he will go. I tell them what to do, and they will do. I know what it's like to be able to say a word and have somebody do it, right? When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. There it is, capture that in scripture. And turning to the crowd following him, he said this, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. I have not found such great faith. This centurion is not a Jew. He is a Gentile. He is not someone who would have known all the scriptures for all of his life. He is someone who obviously had surrounded himself with people who taught him who Jesus was. He had heard about Jesus. But even he, I I think even a portion of this scripture foreshadows the fact that you can just say the word 
when God's power is in you, when you believe so much in who he is and what he has for your life and what you're going through, you can say the word and it shall be done. I don't have to be right here with you touching you, right? right. For it to happen. Jesus knew already he was not always going to be with his people right there to touch them. This This Gentile understood that I'm not worthy to have you touching me or enter in my house. Jesus, all I need you to do is say the word and it shall be done. That kind of faith right there, that's the faith we're looking for. That's the kind of faith that will tip the scale in your favor. That's the kind of belief and trust. If it can just dig down deep in your life, that's going to get you on the winning team. That is going to be what works for you. That is what we're striving after. Just say the word, Jesus. Now, there is another scripture, and it's found in Mark, and it's in Mark chapter 6. Let me read this portion to you. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. This is the instance in Scripture where people, all of us, if Jesus was standing here right here teaching us right now, we would be amazed at everything that he was telling us, right? Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that's been given to him? And he even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? (laughs) I just just see the eye rolls in this part, right? Isn't this just the carpenter? Is this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters just right here with us in the crowd? Isn't he just some ordinary guy just like you and me, right? Who is this guy? Jesus said to them, only in his hometown among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith amazed. There's that same word, right? Jesus in our life and this life that we live for him is going to be amazed one way or the other. Is he going to be amazed with a period or is he going to be amazed with an exclamation point, right? You have the opportunity in your life to tip the scale one way or the other. You can live the life that he's saying, I am amazed that you did that again. I am amazed that you didn't trust me. I am amazed that when it counted, you didn't believe in me. Or you can tip that scale to say, I am amazed with that great faith that you have. I am amazed that you took that step in your life. I am amazed that you believed in me enough to trust me with your child, enough to trust me with the things of your life and the details of your life. I'm amazed by you. You gotta tip the scale one way or another. You see, we all in this life have um, the opportunity to activate or to quench the power of Jesus all in the way that we actually use our faith, right? Do you wanna, do you want, Jesus to know that he is your first love. He knows that he is the first love of you when you show him by the things and the way that you live your life. It's like a kid with their artwork. I can say this is an amazing picture. I can say it, but I show it when I hang it on the fridge, right? When I hang their artwork on the fridge, it's like, yeah, that she really likes her fat picture because she put it right there front and center. I covered it up. He covered his pictures over Kelson's a lot. You know, it's like that. It's got to be that big brother syndrome a little bit. But you show him. It's not enough in this life to be someone who just says it, someone who just sings it, someone who even just reads it. I mean, when was the last time that worship truly made you weep, right? That it made you weep. That you read the word and you didn't just think, wow, that is truth to live by. 
but you got up off your couch and you walked into the most devastating circumstance you've ever walked into and you did it with faith because you trusted in what you read in the word that morning. You were willing to walk it out. You will amaze Jesus one way or the other. Do you wanna activate his power or do you wanna quench it in your life? Because right here in scripture, we have the opportunity as believers to do both. And my, my like what causes me just to, to grieve and to check my own life is the fact that the ones that didn't believe were the ones that knew about him the most. The ones that had been raised in church. The ones that had had his word from the time that they were this little. The one that could quote word for word the scriptures that are right here. They knew it all, but they were not the ones that when it counted, they were the ones that Jesus was amazed at their lack of unbelief. You see, people, there's two types of amazing with us. Olympians, right? They're amazing. Love the Olympics. Amazing. Politicians, amazing, right? Like if you're looking at people, right? People are going to be on a scale, whether we like it or not. And you can, you can view it in your life by whatever you think. But at some point, standing before Jesus, how are we going to tip the scale in our favor? How do we get that scale to tip? In our favor, we learn to be amazed instead of amazed. And, you know, like, like Mike Schaefer was saying this morning, God isn't looking for 100% perfection here. You cannot tell me that this centurion soldier that caused Jesus to say, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. I have never seen that yet. And he is like surrounded with people that he knows and people who know the word. But you can't tell me that that soldier has lived a perfect life. He's a, he's a Roman soldier, right? He didn't live, you, you can't live any more of a perfect life than he could. We can't, it's not possible. But it is still possible to tip the scale, to keep working, to keep growing when we fail get back up and try again. And then we fail and then we get back up and try again and we keep going. That's what we're looking for in our life. You know, like your faith in your life, faith is like something you have that will become something you had if you don't use it. It is like that cute sweater that you give away. Right, because it sat in your closet and they told you that if you don't wear it for a year, you need to get rid of it, right? Um, and so you went through your closet and you got rid of all those things that you don't wear anymore and you gave it away. And you gave it away to somebody you knew. And then that person comes in that, you know, a few months later wearing that cute sweater and you're like, wow, that looks amazing on them, right? I, I, why did I give that away? That is an amazing sweater. But you weren't using it. You gave it to somebody else. Your faith is going to be just like that. Something you have. You can say, I have faith. But if you are not using it in some way in your life, it will become something you had. And all you're going to be able to do is look around you and notice how amazing it looks on somebody else. Wow, she has great faith. Do you know what she's believing for in her life? Can you believe that? Wow, in this situation that is so heartbreaking and feels so crushing, he is standing strong in prayer and showing up and serving other people anyways, right? That kind of faith looks good on you. But if you aren't exercising it and using it in your own life, something you have becomes something you had because you didn't put it into practice. It's not enough to tell Jesus, you're my first love. I have so much faith in, in that it is to be able to say, you're my first love. I have faith, and here I go to use it, right? I'm going to put this into practice. So that's what I'm here to say to you today in 10 minutes, because this is going to be quick, because actually I'm almost done. Three, way, three ways to tip the scale in your favor, right? I feel like I'm pulling out a PK moment right here, right now. At the very end, I give you a list, right? 
three ways to tip the scale in your favor from amazed to amazed. That's all we have to do. The first one is this, keep the conversation consistent. Keep it consistent. Maybe it's not always even coming out your mouth as words, but it's in your mind throughout the day, not just in the morning or in the moment that you were thinking of Jesus, not just right here, right now in this church because we're talking about Jesus, because we're singing about Jesus, because we're saying the name of Jesus and understanding his power, but that conversation is consistent. Carrie was telling me recently she was visiting an old friend. She wanted to pop in and check on them, and she said, I was just going to go by for a few minutes and, and just catch up and see how they were doing. She says, Three hours later, I left and I had not said two words. Like the person just talked and talked and talked. That's not conversation. That's like a speech, right? That's like you are just sitting and listening. I I mean, Carrie was like, I was exhausted from hearing three hours, exhausted. Now, I know that Jesus isn't up there just exhausted with the the, um, things that we bring him. He can't be exhausted. He doesn't get tired. But I have to wonder if he just kind of gives a little bit of an eye roll because we're like, I can't get a word in edgewise. Like, keep the conversation consistent. When you're, you're like smiling and talking back at me, it's a conversation, right? We're both in this together. We're in this together, God. We're talking to each other. I'm pouring out my heart, and you're listening, and you're telling me what to do, and I'm obeying, and I'm trusting. Keep the conversation consistent in your life. Remember, it's a conversation. It's not just you telling God what you need. It's listening for him to reply back, this is what I know you need, right? Those two things are going to be different. The next one is this, number two, let the word become relevant to your world. This word has got to be so relevant to your world. This word has got to be able to rise up in you and be the answer for everything you're struggling with, right? Everything that might be a struggle in your life. I, I, um, you know, I think the scripture that you're holding on to sometimes should just like roll off your tongue like a Starbucks order. Are you struggling in your life with your finances? Are you wondering if you should give? Then you should have the scripture in Malachi that where God talks about giving that he's saying, will you just test me on this? Just give and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour so much blessing on you, you won't even be able to contain it. Can you take a risk? Can you give a little bit? Can you activate that faith that you say you have? And can you do that? God, I don't understand why I'm going through this circumstance in my life. You're asking me to trust you, but right here, right now, I don't get it. I don't get why this hasn't come through for me yet. I don't get why my child is not walking with the Lord. God, I've done everything that I can. I don't understand. But God is saying in his word, can you trust in me? Can you trust in the Lord with all of your heart? Can you not lean on your own understanding here, but can you just walk out your life and know that I will direct you in the way that you need to go? God, I feel purposeless. I don't understand. There's just, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, why am I here, God? I don't think I have a purpose in this life. When you can look in the word of God and, and if you're struggling with that or with your calling, like Pastor Kelly was talking about last week about how everybody has a calling. In Ephesians, it tells us that you were a, a created. You are like a workmanship of Christ. You have been created to do good works, which he planned in advance for you to do, right? He planned it in advance. It's the answer. It's right here and always right here. God, I don't understand why I'm so lonely in this season. This season is going on and on and on like it doesn't have an end. It feels like I'm on repeat, God. I feel like I got some, some, some things going right and then wham. I hear this news and it knocks me down. God, I've been trying everything in my heart. I've been doing what you tell me to do. You know what it says in Leviticus? Leviticus, like old Bible, like old, old Bible, right? Old, old word, but still the word. Leviticus 26 talks about if you obey my decrees, if you follow my 
requests my demands. I will send you rain in its season. In its season, right? I hold the times and the seasons in my hand because I am God. I will send you rain in its season and the ground will yield its crops. The trees of the the trees of the fields will grow their fruit. It says in Leviticus 26 is that, that five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred people will chase 10,000 and they're gonna fall by the sword before you because you're going in my power, right? That's what it says. It says, I, in your season, when I send rain, you will have to move out the harvest. You, you will still be eating last year's harvest when you're gonna have to make room for the new. I love that portion of scripture so much because it reminds me, if I keep going, if I keep using my faith and trusting and stepping and moving forward, not sitting, sulking, wondering why, bitter, complaining, irritated, discouraged, downtrodden, all of those things. But if I rise up and do what I believe God is asking me to do, then he knows that in his season, I'm gonna have to move all of that out to make room for the plenty that he is about to send my way, right? Right? It's in the word, you guys. And this word is our first love. This word, because I can't hold hands with Jesus, he sent me this to say right here is the picture of my love. I want this to be first in your life. You wanna tip the scale in your favor and live an amazing life for Christ or just amazed, eye roll, right? Then you gotta learn to let this word become relevant to your world. Not to your parents' world, not to your grandparents' world, your world as a teenager, your world right here, wherever you are. Not just for the young people, your world at 85. Whatever it looks like, if you're living and breathing right here, this word is relevant to your world. It is. And number three, and the last, surround yourself with people who push you, not prevent you. Surround yourself with people who push you. It's right here in those two instances where I talked about how Jesus was amazed or amazed. The centurion was surrounded with people, with, with people who went out on his behalf and said, Jesus, you got to do this for this guy. He is worthy of you to do this for him. Think about who is surrounding him. These people were like, we know the man who can heal your servant. We know the one who can do it. Think about who he was surrounding with. And they went out on his behalf to speak to Jesus. Now think about the other instance back in Mark where Jesus could do no miracles there. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the one that makes stools and tables for our house? Is this the one whose sisters are right here? Is this the girl that is speaking but never went to Bible college? Is it the one that didn't grow up in church? Is it the one that came from an alcoholic family? Aren't they just like me? Haven't they failed like five times they've tried to start a business? Like who are they? Who are they? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Those people were surrounding each other and all you can see is like this, this pit of negativity and discouragement, right? I promise you negativity will breed unbelief in your life as fast as those wild pigs breed on the farm, right? <laughs> Kelly talks about the, those pigs, they have like a hundred at a time. I don't know, but it's true. If you are, you'll be like the five most people you surround yourself with, right? They say that, experts say it, they say it for a reason. I mean, there is a reason why, you know, every now and then I think, man, I really wanna eat some fried chicken. I really want some. Come hanging around Pastor Kelly. The man loves fried chicken. Fried us up some chicken last night. There's a reason why when I, I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see that it's pie night at Antoinette's, I want to go, right? Because I hang around Shannon Schaefer. When I walk the snack aisle at Target, I'm like, oh, I haven't tried those Oreos yet. Got to get them. Because I hang around 
her. I become like the people that I hang around. You see, there's a reason in my life when I feel devastated and sad and I don't know what to do. It, there's a reason why when I reach out to people, when I, I reached out to a friend um, recently when I was sad, the, the She Knew Gathering, and we were going through some of the things, and I was just, you know, just really feeling down, and I reached out to a friend. And you know what that friend did? What she didn't do was, like, join me in my car and let's drive to Pity Party City together. She sent me a worship song. She's like, Lisa, this is what I feel like you need to listen to. I'd never even heard this song before. I listen to it every day now because that's the kind of person I want to be surrounded with. It's a song from, it's Hill Song, and it talks about new wine in the crushing, in the pressing. Jesus is making new wine in the soil. Now I surrender. He is making something new in my life. That's the kind of person I want to be surrounded with. When I'm sitting this week with Shannon and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going through the, the woes of my life or feeling like I am ineffective or people aren't growing, Shannon says, Lisa Goins? Like, I got the full name. Lisa Goins? What are you saying about my life? My life has fruit because you have poured into me because you hang around me. And I'm like, yes, that's what I needed to hear, right? Not someone that says, yeah, it's probably never going to get any better. Well, you know that people do this and this person's mad and this person does that. We should all just go to Pity Party City together, right? And just park and just quit and give up. But instead, it's like Shannon put in front of me this shiny red apple and says, look at my fruit. You're a part of that. You are a part of that. You know what? The, the most naive thing you could think in this life is that you are in no competition at all for your heart. The most naive thing that you could think is, is that you just get to show up a winner. The most naive thing that you could think is that you are not fighting a real enemy for the competition of your heart. That is why the scripture has to say, do not love the world or anything it has to offer you. God knows he has the power and everything that you need to be successful in this life. But he knows while you are walking it out right here, right now on this earth, you are in a competition for your heart. And that competition is showing up fierce. That enemy is showing up prepared, not just to take you down, but to take you out of the game altogether. Get on the bench. You don't belong in this game. But God is saying, no, 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 no. If you love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, if you will keep our conversation consistent, if you will let my word be relevant to your world and your circumstances that you are in right now, if you will surround yourself with the right people that will push you forward instead of preventing you to accomplish what it is that God wants to accomplish in your life, you will tip the scale. You will live an amazing life. But don't be naive. Don't be naive to think you aren't holding something in the balance. Each and every one of us someday. And I, yeah, Branson, you come up and play. All of us someday, every one of us, we don't get to escape it. Every one of us will stand before Jesus one day. All of us will. Every one of us. And we're going to say, God, I loved you. I told you I did. I told you. You were my first love, God. It, it, those words came out my mouth. But God is going to say, I heard you say it. But did you show it to me? Did you show it to me by the love you showed to other people? By those that you served? By the way you used your faith? Did you show it to me where you defied all the odds and rose up in my power when you should have just quit by the world standards? Did you even try and tip the scale? You see, God isn't looking for 100% perfection. It's like, he's, it's like he's got this picture 
of our life where I can look at this picture and I can just focus on this one part where I don't like that I look like a spud. I don't like that. But God is saying, I see your life. I see the parts that were not so good, but I'm looking at the whole picture here. I'm measuring the mistakes you made and I'm looking at the times where you really rose up to the challenge and you let my word rise up in you and you tip the scale. And our job, I believe, if we're gonna be victorious and we're gonna win this game, is to stand before Jesus, not to be perfect because we can't. It's just to say, God, here is this broken life, Lord, but I tried so hard to tip the scale to tip the scale, to use more of what you gave me, to believe more in your word than what I, I, I doubted in myself, to believe that I was created to be right here, right now, alive in this world so that I could share you with other people, right? Don't you wanna do that? Don't you wanna tip the scale? Yes, stand up with me today. I just wanna say a prayer over everybody here this morning as we end this service, I just wanna say, take it seriously. Don't take it lightly. You don't know the moment that your game comes to an end. It might be when you've had every golden year and you walk out of this life, or it could be sooner, we don't know. So every day we show up to this game, believing and trusting and learning to tip the scale in our life. God, I pray for each and every person in the place, Lord Jesus, for everybody that would be online this morning. I just want you guys to hold out your hands, hands open this morning, just hands open. God, we receive from you everything that you are speaking to us this morning. God, forgive us for our doubt and our disbelief, for our discouragement. Lord Jesus, we want to be believers. We want to be the ones, Lord Jesus, that are in this game to win it. Not to win it for ourselves so we look good, but to win it for you so you show up and you are good, Father. Your power is for us. Let us be people who truly believe that we can just say the word and you will be because we believe it so strongly in our heart. God, I know the enormity and the magnitude of the things that are happening within this room that people are facing, the dilemmas that they're grappling with back and forth, the doubts that they have, the uncertainties, the wondering what the next day holds. All of those things, Lord Jesus, are in this room and we don't get it. There are things happening all around us that break our heart. But God, your word says that you see us. Your word says that your ear is attentive to your people, that you hear the sound of our voice, Lord Jesus. Let our voices and the way we use our faith amaze you, God. Lord Jesus, let your power flow freely through your people today and every day as we leave this place and we go get in the game, as we stay in the game, as we finish strong, Lord Jesus, just the way we started. We love you so very much, Lord Jesus. We love you so very much, Lord Jesus. You are an amazing God. Let us never do this life without you, Lord. Let us trust you with every detail of our life. We love you so very much, Lord Jesus.